We start a new series today called Influencers. You can download the notes. They provided a link for you. Feel free to do that. But look with me in Acts chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 4 and then go right into verses 14 and 17. And this is what the Bible said. I want to talk to you on this thought, the influence of Pentecost. The influence of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost said, come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to, to them tongues resembling fire, which were being distributed among them. One version said it, it sat upon them. And they rested on each one of them as each person received the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled. That is, diffused throughout their be- being, I love this description, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, different languages. We would call it today a prayer language, speaking in tongues, a tongue that is not native to your own, your own language. And the Bible said that the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. One verse says, giving them the utterance or the prompting to speak. Verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, Let this be explained to you. Listen closely and pay attention to what I have to say. These people are not drunk as you assume since it is only the third hour of the day, meaning nine o'clock in the morning. But this is the beginning. I love that. This is the beginning of what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit Upon all mankind or all flesh, sons, daughters, men, women, everybody who is hungry for the power of the Spirit can receive. So I want to talk about the power or the influence of Pentecost today for the next few moments. And then we're going to take some time in the altar and pray for people who are hungry for the fullness of the Spirit of the Lord. Now, if you're new to Pentecost and you're new to our church, this I hope this will explain a little bit further about who we are and what we believe and why we still believe it's significant, important, even in today's world. If you can show me where speaking in tongues is no longer relevant in 2022 because the Bible says that, then come show me. I hadn't read it that way yet. So God is going to help us today, hopefully give us understanding. So let's look together, can we? Father, thank you for the atmosphere of your presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you'll do today. Let preaching be easy, enjoyable, and effective. Let the touch of the Spirit of God and make, indeed make the difference. Open up our heart. Let us be receptive to you, and we thank you in advance for everything you'll do in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. You may be seated. The influence of Pentecost. This series we start today is called Influencers, and we will talk about influencers in the scripture. But today we talk about the influence of Pentecost, and I wanna tell you that influence in our world does matter. If you look at the definition of influence, it really means it's the capacity or the power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, the behavior, and the opinions of others. This is according to dictionary.com. Moving people to do something or swaying them in your favor. Online marketers would tell you they understand the power of influencers. Now, I didn't really understand this thing until my kids explained it to me just a little bit more, but there are people on social media that are actually social media influencers. And we have all been influenced by people in our lives, whether we admit that or not. My parents have influenced me, my siblings, or my sibling, my sister, my student pastor, pastors that have preached to me, teachers, coaches, friends, and peers, and coworkers, just to name a few. But they have all influenced us, if we were honest. But the early church was shaped by influencers. Many of these gathered in an upper room and received the power of the Holy Spirit from a visitation and an outpouring. These followers of Christ were empowered to move people or encourage people to believe that Jesus indeed was the Son of God. And we are here today because of the influence that took place at Pentecost. Pentecost began as, as and remains one of the major holidays in the Jewish calendar. It occurs 50 days after the Passover. The word Pentecost literally means 50th or 50th day. 
And for the Jews, Pentecost was the time when they celebrated the first harvest of the agricultural year. It was the time when they gave thanks to God for what the land had produced and for what their labor had yielded. For Christians, Pentecost marks the beginning Many believe the advancement of the New Testament church. You could go back to the Old Testament and talk about how the people of God were redeemed out of, out of Egypt. And some people believe that might even be the beginning of the church. I'm not here to argue or debate that with you. But we do see evidence of the fact that the church really began to have traction after Pentecost. Say, Pastor, would you prove that to me? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because the Bible said that Peter preached in response, and I read it to you just a moment ago, what he began to describe and explain what was taking place in the upper room. And as he preached a message about Jesus, the Bible indicated that there was a harvest of 3,000 souls that were converted in that one sermon. I wish I could tell you that I've had 3,000 people converted in one sermon, but that has never happened to me yet. I believe there'll be a day that it'll take place. Y'all pray for me. Come on, y'all help me out. Agree with me that it'll take place at some point. But this is what happened on this, on this day. 3,000 people converted to Christ. You want to talk about influence. Influence happened in this moment with Peter. See, I remember Peter was, as he preached this first sermon that we read about in Acts chapter two, this is the same Simon Peter who 53 days early had just said about Jesus, I don't even know who you're talking about. I don't know who he is. And use some other terminology to try to convince those who are asking him if he was a follower of Christ. This is the same Peter that had nothing to say about Jesus when those asked him directly if he was a follower of Christ. But Peter, on the day of Pentecost, stood before a crowd, maybe even some of the same people that he feared, but yet he boldly declared the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I feel like preaching right here. Going further, if you look at this, Peter stood before many of the same people who shouted, and crucify him and it stood before Pontius Pilate in the city of Jerusalem but now Peter is probably standing in front of these same people saying you need to follow the one true God there's only one way to the father and that is through Jesus Christ whom you crucified yes he died he was buried but he rose again as alive and well today and you need to follow him see Peter did not simply change his mind but Peter himself was changed and that's the power of receiving Christ, but that's also the power of Pentecost and the power of the Holy Spirit. Something happened to Peter. Something happened to the apostles. Something happened to those that were in that upper room. Jesus literally set them on fire, not physical fire, but Holy Ghost fire to decree a thing about who God was. Look what the Bible said in Acts 6, 17, verse 6. He said, and here are those who are turning the world upside down. What does that mean for us today? Well, because of the influence of Pentecost and because of the influence of those who are in that upper room, we sit here today, we watch today because we realize there might be something to this thing called Jesus. And let me just tell you, there is something to this man named Jesus. He is the one that can turn your life around, that can change you wholeheartedly, that can put your feet on a solid ground, that can change your going and your ways and give you a fresh outlook on your life. We see here that Pentecost marks the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by which you and I receive the fullness, as Pastor Amy said a moment ago, the fullness of the Spirit of God. You see, this fullness of the Spirit, the Bible indicates to us that it will give us boldness to further the work of God. We cannot do all that God has asked us to do in our own natural ability and in our own natural talent and in our own resources, but we do need the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to accomplish the task that is before us and to build the kingdom of God. Pastor, why don't you prove that to me? Well, look at Acts chapter one, verses six, six through eight, where the Bible says, and when they had come together, they asked him repeatedly, Lord, are you at this time reestablishing your kingdom? They were hopeful that he was gonna do it right then, but this is what he said. He said, it is not for, it is not for you to know the times or, or, or the seasons which the Father has fixed for his own authority, but you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to tell people all about me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 
area and the ends of the earth. At the time, we are the ends of the earth. And aren't you thankful that that gospel message somehow, some way got to the North American continent and we have hope today because of what Jesus has done for us. See, Jesus tells these apostles, apostles to remain in the city of Jerusalem until the power of the Holy Spirit comes and shows up and it comes upon them. He was not sending them out to evangelize just based on their life experiences or their understanding limited of the religious laws and the teachings of the day. He was not suggesting that just spending three years in his presence had resulted in them being equipped to do the work that lay ahead of them. Instead, he said, I want you to go to a place that I have designated and I want you to wait there. I want you to rest there. I want you to come in agreement there and stay right there because there's going to be an anointing. There's going to be a power of the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a presence that's about to come upon you and once they had this power they would be ready to go but, but he said wait until this happens and I would just tell you that the problem with some of us in the church world today is we just don't want to wait. We don't want to tarry in the presence of God. We want God to come real quick. God, you got an hour and 15 to 20 minutes. And if you'll come in that hour and 15, 20 minutes, we'll be good. We don't want to stay long. Listen, I don't have time to talk about the old saints of the church. I grew up in the church. Some of y'all, the church is brand new to you, but just let me testify to you for a minute. There was a day that when you came to the altar that the saints would get a hold of you and they would not let you up until you left different. Now, that was scary a little, little bit because they would shake you, they would hit you, and it was all in the love of the Lord. Come on, y'all. That's not the church that we are, but I, I mean, we, we're not going to beat you up or anything like that. But literally, they would shake you, and, and they, would, they would yell in your ear, and then they would shout and come back and shake you on the shoulders, and, and you would be trying to get up because you were ready to leave, and they would push you right back down because God wasn't finished with you yet. Come on, where are the real people at in here? But I want to tell you that sometimes it would do us do some good not to beat people up in the altar, but just to linger with them and say, I'll stay right here as long as you want to stay till God can do exactly what you need him to do. That's what Jesus said. He said, just stay in that one place because I'm about to send the comforter. It's good that I go away. So if I go away, the comforter can come to you. That comforter is the Holy Spirit. Now, let me quickly give you three quick thoughts about Pentecost and the influence of it. Number one, being anointed with oil represents the Holy Spirit. Being anointed with oil represents the Holy Spirit. Now, we still anoint people with oil in this church. Now, trust me, our oil is a lot fresher than the oil that I grew up on. Some of the oil that I grew up had been there since 1935. Come on, y'all. It was, it stunk. It was nasty. I mean, it was clumping together. Come on, where the real people out in here know what I'm talking about? You crazy. Our smell is good. It's like sweet. I mean, it's good. You, you're good with it. But being anointed with oil represents the Holy Spirit. See, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, you see a mentioning of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. It was when Samuel was directed by the Lord after Saul had been rejected king. He said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse and I want you to anoint the new king. And this is what the Bible said in 1 Samuel 16, 12, 13. He said, the Lord said to Samuel, arise and anoint him for he he is, one, he is the one. And verse 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed David in the presence of his brothers, and catch this, the Spirit of the Lord came upon uh, uh, mightily upon David from that day forward. There was an anointing that took place right there in the presence of his father and his brothers who thought he wasn't even qualified or even worthy to be in the lineup to be king, but God selected him. And he said, Anoint him with oil. I want to tell you that the anointing of the Holy Spirit Spirit is what helped Samson, what helped David, what helped Elijah, what helped Elisha and the apostles and that same holy anointing of the Holy Spirit helps us today to do what God has intended for us to accomplish. So much is said about the anointing of the Lord and the Spirit of God coming upon his people. And if I were to ask people on how to receive the Spirit of God, there would be different answers in the room. But if I can give you one key to receiving the Spirit of God, it would be this. They were fully submitted, yielded to the Father. This means surrendering all. The reason some people will not be full of the Holy Spirit is because yet they, they will simply still not yield everything to the Lord. You gotta be submitted. 
See, the reason David was qualifying for the anointing at an early age he, he, is because he submitted to authority. He, submit, he submitted to his earthly father. He watched the sheep while his brothers went to battle. He kept his sheep while the brothers were lining up for Samuel to anoint a new king. He submitted to his earthly father by taking cheese and crackers to the battle line to the king to get a report at the camp. Are you getting the point? He was surrendered to the will of the father. And on this Pentecost Sunday, with the anointing of God, the, the oil representing the anointing of the Holy Spirit, can I ask you a question? Are you fully surrendered and submitted to the father? Have your desires become the desires of God first? Have you submitted everything, who you are, what you're about, your will, your finance, your possession, your family, everything that you have, have you submitted it to the Lord? If you want the anointing and the Spirit of God to be released in your life, you must be in alignment with Him. So being anointed with oil represents the Holy Spirit. Number two, the Lord's hand signifies the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts chapter 11 verse 21 says it this way, and the hand or the power, the presence of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord for salvation, accepting and drawing near to Jesus as Messiah and as Savior according to the Amplified Version. See, the success of the early church was attributed to the influence of the Holy Spirit being with them and in them. Our significance as a church today, this is totally my opinion, is dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord being with us. I love all this. I like all the lights. I like all the, all the LED walls. I like iPads. I, I like a cool table here. I like it all. I like every bit of that. But I'm going to tell you what I like even more than all of that. I love the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the power of God residing in us. You can have all this and no spirit and it just be a look. But you better have some substance. You better have some power. Because I'm going to tell you, there's a real enemy that desires to sift your soul. And, and, and listen, we're not as good as Disney with the light show. But let me tell you the difference between us and Disney. We, they're going to make you feel good. We hope we make you feel good. But let me tell you something. You may leave there and say, man, that was great. We want you to leave here and say, man, I've been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit and what he's done in my life. See, uh, we, 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 we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You know, I said the church's, the church's growth bears powerful witness to both the necessity and the availability of the hand of God to accomplish his business. Why are we here as a church? It's not just to have good church services, even though we better. I want to. I want to celebrate well. I want to worship well. I, I, I want to preach something to you that will challenge you and encourage you. But we are here as the body of Christ to accomplish the will of the Father. And one of the best ways that we can do that is being empowered from Him from on high. There is a natural progression that if God blesses you more, enlarges you more, that you will need more of His supernatural power. I pray every single day, oh God, I cannot do what you've asked me to do without your touch and your hand and your anointing and your spirit being upon my life. You see, Jesus commissioned his disciples. I want you to go preach. I want you to teach. I want you to baptize. I want you to make disciples. And that same commission and that same command has been given to us as a body of believers. And they knew that when God would enlarge them, they needed the power of the spirit. And I stand before you today and I declare the same thing. If God is going to enlarge us, we need the power of the spirit of God to help us in this day. Come on, that's a good place to praise him. Do you realize that the disciples had the boldness to speak because of the power of God? See, only God working in them and through them could, could account for the miracles and the mass conversions that would begin to happen by the church. I mean, if you go read the book of Acts, and if you haven't read the book of Acts lately, I mean, you should in our Bible reading plan. You should have already read it once. You'll read it again in, in the second part of the year. But if, you, if you're reading the, the book of Acts, and you begin to see all the things that happened. Yes, they faced persecution, but man, there was advancement. Wonderful things that took place. See, when you and I are filled with God's power and his presence, we too can see the results of the early church. At the end of June, the last Wednesday night in June, we're gonna celebrate the miracles that took place in May. We're trying to give people time to get those sent into us. We're hoping to shoot a couple videos. We're, oh, we're going to celebrate on Wednesday night, the last Wednesday night of June. Mark it on your calendars. I believe it's the 29th or somewhere right there, whatever that week is, right there before we get to July. We're going to celebrate the miracles of God. I'm telling you, the same miracles that we read about in the Word of God in the New Testament church, they can still happen today. 
And it's because of the power of the Spirit of God. Here's the key. The early church and the believers continually sought to be filled with the Spirit. I'm afraid that too many times we focus on the Spirit of God simply on a Pentecost Sunday. And I'm thankful that we don't do that. I mean, we, we talk about the Spirit of God I mean, pretty much every week. If you're a guest, we, I mean, you, you probably figured out we have Pentecostal church already, but, but we talk about it all the time because we know we need the empowerment of the Lord. You can read about in Acts 4, 23 through 31. They were known as a community of believers who spent hours and even days together praying. And this day, we need to pray now more than ever before. They, they were asking God, asking for his power. Go read it in Acts 4, 42 through, through 47. They were longing for a fresh touch, a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit that would in turn, that would, would, would in, uh, in turn impending certain failure into a miracle and make their extraordinary excitement possible, not because of them, but because of him. And I want to tell you today, we need to be praying those same prayers. Listen, I'm thankful for everything that we have happen on a Sunday morning. Monday, I'm tired and, and I'm a little bit weary, but I, I, when I come in here to pray, I say, God, I thank you so much for everything that you did. But you know what I pray before I end that time of prayer? God, I need a fresh touch of you right now today. We as the body of Christ should be praying that every single day. God, I need a little bit more of you. I need a little bit more of you to help me make it. I need a little bit more of you to be a witness. I need to be a little bit more of you to do the things that you've called me to do. And Paul told the Christians at Ephesians to make it a priority to be filled with the fullness of God in Ephesians chapter 3. He prayed that God would strengthen them with might through his spirit. So we understand that, yes, the anointing of the Lord, anointing oil represents the spirit of God. The hand of the Lord rests with it. But then number three, a prayer language is evidence of the Holy Spirit. Not the only evidence. We believe it is an initial evidence, but it's not the only evidence. Some people say, I just want to talk in a tongue once. Well, I don't want to talk in a tongue once. I want to talk in a tongue whenever the Spirit gives the utterance. That's more than a one-time encounter. And then there's more of the, of the Spirit of God. There's fruits of the Spirit. You know, I, I, I've seen people talk in a tongue but never advance to the fruit of the Spirit. And some of y'all need to advance to the fruit of the Spirit. I, not y'all. I'm talking about people that, you know, visit from time to time and people that are watching us online later. But you, you, you catch what I'm saying. There's more than just talking in a tongue. But the Bible says in Acts 2, verse 3, I read it to you a moment ago, then there appeared to them divided tongues or different tongues as a fire. And the reason I changed versions here is because I wanted you to see it a little bit different. And it sat upon each of them. Look what John the Baptist declared in Matthew 3, 11. He said, I baptize you with water under repentance, but he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to, to tie or to, to bear, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So tongues of fire sat on them. John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness crying out, preparing the way of the Lord. He said, there's one's coming who, who's greater than me, and I'm telling you, he's going to baptize you with fire. Here, the idea behind fire, let me just give you a little background on this, and I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here as, as, as quickly as I can. The idea behind the picture of fire is usually purification. It's, it, it's, it's a refiner. As a refiner, it uses fire to make pure gold. Fire can burn away what is temporary, leaving only what will last. I believe that the reason it was tongues of fire because God was burning away the things that did not need to be in them and the things that needed to last would stay. That's why you need to seek the Spirit of God every single day. And it's more than just a one-time thing. See, this is an excellent illustration of the principle of the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's not just for abstract power, but the filling of the Holy Spirit is also for purity. And I would tell you, if you want power, you need purity. Maybe the reason some of us don't get power is because we don't have purity. So I would encourage you to understand that this word sat has, 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 a, has a mark for us in the test, New Testament. This is what it really means. It carries the idea of completed preparation and a certain permanence of position and condition. Did you catch that? It, 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 it's, it's a co completed preparation. It's, it's, a, it's a certain position and condition. It sat on them. The tongues of fire sat upon them. Now, this seems like a strange phenomenon of fire that had never happened before. And, 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 and I'm telling you, we believe that it happens in, in the world today from the standpoint of people being filled with the Holy Spirit, but not like this is described in the Bible. This Spirit of God was present within and upon each individual. Oh, how I'd love to have been there. 
See, there are people today debate whether or not tongues are necessary to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To me, there's no debate. The fullness of the Spirit of God, what we teach in our church, what we believe. Now, we don't have a class on talking in tongues. We don't have a class. Say these five syllables and you got it. We don't do that. That's not us. The Holy Spirit does not need our help. What you want from the Holy Spirit is what the gift of the Spirit from the Holy Spirit. There's no debate. You're going to speak in a, in a different tongue than what is your native language. So if your native language is, is English, it will be a different language than that. When you receive the baptism of the Holy, Holy Spirit, you will know that it is not your native tongue. The Bible said in Acts 2.4 that they began to speak with other, other, different as the Spirit gave them utterance. In response to the feeling of the Holy Spirit, those present, not only the 12 apostles, but everybody in that room, they begin to speak in another tongue, a prayer language, a different tongue. These, catch this. These were the languages that were never taught. They've never spoken these before. And they were speaking them as the Spirit prompted them or gave them the ability to do it. Now, when the crowd came, they heard these Christians speaking in their own foreign language. The, the people outside the room could begin to understand what was being spoken. And this was all a setup for what was about to happen through the message that Peter was about to preach. See, the Christians could be heard from the windows of the upper room and they went out onto some kind of balcony or the temple court. And if you go to what they think is the upper room, you'll understand what that looks like. We hear them speaking in tongues about the wonderful works of God. And I want to tell you one of the reasons why you want, to, you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because there are times that you need to pray in English, but there's some times that you need to pray in the Spirit or in a tongue because the enemy does not know what you're saying. It's confusing to him. So you may speak in a tongue that is another language that you don't even understand. I have been in, in places where there was a, a tongue that, that was spoken and it was in the, the native language of where we are and the people respond. I said, what are they doing? They understood what this person was saying even though it was not their native tongue. The people could understand it and it drew them to the power and the presence of God. I, I won't close, somebody come play for me so I'll try to close this thing down. See, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe this, we teach this. You're going to pray in, or speak in another tongue or, or, or what we say, we, we make it sound a little better because some people get afraid of speaking in tongues. You're going to pray in that prayer language. Whatever makes you comfortable, same thing. Now, here you got to understand this about the Holy Spirit. Let me close with this. The Holy Spirit's job is to move. It's to convict. It's to help bring other gifts Spiritual gifts, let them be cultivated in your life. Heal the sick, empower you and, and give you boldness to be a witness. And the Holy Spirit will correct you. Those of you that are full of the Holy Spirit, if you do something not right, the Holy Spirit will tell you you, did, you didn't do something right. Hey man, there's been a few times in my life, I, I, I mean, I'll just be honest with you, even the last few months, I got a little heated under the collar. I know you're shocked at that, that I get upset over something. I know you're surprised, but I got a little upset. And as soon as I got done, I told the people that I was upset they could, they could leave. I said, you can leave now. I, I know y'all are more saved than I am. You never get upset, but y'all keep praying for me. The Lord's working on me. <laughs> as soon as they left, the Holy Spirit started convicting me for my attitude, for my words, how I treated them in that moment. And then after the Holy Spirit beat me up, Amy came out. <laughs> you know, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Amy. Come on, y'all. <laughs> and said, how do you feel about it? You feel good about what you just did? I was like, I don't need your help because the Holy Spirit's already working on me, so it's already covered. <laughs> you know what I had to do? I had to bring those people back to my office. And I said, I need you to forgive me. I said, I was... I did not treat you well. I did not speak to you well. You did not deserve that. I let something else that I'm dealing with come in and I took that frustration out on you. And that wasn't right. And I said, the Holy Spirit's not pleased. And so as your pastor, I'm asking you to forgive me. As your friend, I'm asking you to forgive me. I need to do better. But the Holy Spirit will do that. He'll do that. And see, that is why some people don't want to go after the fullness of the Spirit of God. 
because they don't want that. They don't want that accountability. But I want to tell you, friend, we all need the power of the Spirit of God. Now, let me just say, the Holy Spirit wants to invade you. Now, that sounds like an alien abduction. That's not what it is. Invade you means he wants to control all aspects of your life. See, some people are good with the baptism of the Holy Spirit as long as they don't have to yield, yield or submit or give up control. If you want the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to say, God, I want all you have for me, and I give you control. You want to know why it took me so long to get baptized in the Holy Spirit? I grew up in Pentecost my whole life. But I didn't get baptized until, I don't even know why the pastor hired me. He probably shouldn't have. I, wasn't, I wouldn't have hired me. I wouldn't baptize in the Holy Spirit when I started my first church as a youth pastor. Amy was, and that's probably why we got the job, because she was. I didn't get baptized in the Holy Spirit until my first year in ministry at a revival. When finally I said, okay, God, I'm going to give up control. It wasn't that I was afraid of speaking in tongues or Pentecost. It was I didn't want to give up control. I didn't want to give up the control. But the Holy Spirit wants control. The Holy Spirit wants to envelop you. What does that mean, Pastor? He wants to bring you out of where you are and deliver you because he has something better in mind for you. Envelop you. We would say it this way. Seal you. And when you seal an envelope, it's enclosed. The contents are enclosed. And the only way you get the contents out is if you open them up. He wants to envelop you. The Holy Spirit wants to instruct you. What does that mean? He wants to teach you. He wants to show you the will of God for your life. He's going to say, you don't need to watch that. You don't need to respond to that message. You don't need to go to that website. That girl from high school, she up to no good. Don't answer that. Come on, we're the real people in here. You don't need to put that into your body. You don't need to go back to that bar. You don't need to go back to that club. You don't need that drug. You don't need those things that you want to because now you have given up control of the Lord and he wants to teach you. He wants to instruct you. He wants to show you his will, his ways, his purpose for your life. The Holy Spirit wants to impress you. What does that mean? The old timers would say, getting the witness. He wants to tell you things that you're not going to know on your own. I prayed for somebody one time, and it was because of the power and the unction of the Holy Spirit. And I prayed for them after I got through. and said, how'd you know that? I said, how'd I know what? I mean, I prayed for like 50 people. I don't remember what I prayed. I said, how'd you know that? I said, how did I know what? What you spoke over me, what you prayed over me. How did you know that? Who told you that? I said, the Holy Ghost. Nobody told you that this was going on in my life? No. I felt prompted of the Spirit of God to pray this, so I prayed it. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. We call it in the Pentecostal charismatic world today, reading our mail. It's just a prompting of the Spirit of God that would tell you things or allow you to pray things that you would not naturally know on your own. Happened just this past Friday night in Omaha, Nebraska. Prayed something over two different people. I didn't know it. But the Holy Spirit confirmed it in that moment. The Holy Spirit, lastly, want, come on, stand your feet. I got to quit. The Holy Spirit wants to indwell. What does that mean? He wants to be, catch this, indwell. He wants to be permanently present. That means he wants to be with you always, not just on Sundays and Wednesdays. Come on now. He wants to be with you always, permanently present. When you're at the ball field, he won't be with you. When you're out and about in the town, he's wanting to be with you. Hey, let me say it like this. If I say Amy's my wife, and we go to Bridge Street, I say, honey, you just stay right here in the car. You're my wife, but I just want you to stay right here, and I'll come back when I'm ready for you. Well, first of all, that ain't going to go well for me. Because I might not ever get out of the car. Come on, y'all. 
But because we are, catch this, because we are one, we are together. I tell you, the Holy Spirit wants to be permanently present in your life. And that power and that presence of God is not there to harm you, but he is there to help you. Help you. Can I tell you everything about Pentecost Sunday? I don't fully grasp. I'm not going to act like I know everything about Pentecost. If somebody tries to stand up here and say, I know everything about Pentecost, they liar. Because they don't know everything about Pentecost. They weren't there. How could they? Our God is a mystery. There are things that have not been revealed about him yet. We don't even know everything about God. But here's what I want to tell you. That the Holy Spirit definitely wants to be permanently present in your life. And if he's going to be permanently present, you're going to have to yield control. So receiving the Holy Spirit, let me tell you what happens. Number one, you've got to know Christ as your Savior. And there is an aspect of the Holy Spirit that we receive at salvation because we believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity. So you receive an aspect of the Holy Spirit at salvation, absolutely. But we believe and we teach there is a greater work. There is a fullness thereof of the Spirit. And that happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So, Pastor, how do I do that? You pursue God. You say, Jesus, I want all you have for me. Pastor Ron Phillips, who was a Baptist pastor in Hickson, Tennessee, a little skeptical about the Holy Spirit, went to his prayer closet and said, God, this is real. I want to experience it. And God filled him with the Holy Spirit right there in the closet. Baptist preacher. He couldn't deny it anymore. Some of his own, he began to preach in Pentecostal churches. He began to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Didn't even know it. He'd go down the altar and say, what do we do? How do we pray for people to get the Holy Spirit? Pentecostal preacher, I had said, just lay your hands on me. He's like, all right. <laughs> Here's the difference. He yielded because he wanted the Spirit of God permanently present. Do you want the Spirit of God permanently present? If you do, then pursue the Spirit of God and watch him fill your life. And part of that in feeling, you're going to pray in a language that's not native to your own tongue. So here's what we're going to do today. When you need to go, you're dismissed. It's 10, I think it says 13. There's a glare on it. 10, 13, 10, 14, 10, 15, 10, 12, somewhere in that neighborhood. When you need to go, you can go. We got another service at 11. We're going to pray with people that, want, that are hungry for the Spirit of the Lord. Say, Pastor, I'm not sure about this thing yet. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm ready to go all in and, 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 and go after the Lord in this way. Then this is what I would tell you to do. Just begin to search the scriptures. Just begin to read the word when it talks about Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit, and what happened after those who encountered it. The Holy Spirit didn't make them weird. It did set them apart and make them different but it empowered them for the work that was ahead. Family, do you know what, our, you know what our world needs? It needs a church that's full of the Holy Spirit. It needs a church that's gonna be different. Not different like weird, different, cuckoo, crazy. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm not into that. But I'm talking about empowered for the work of ministry. For the cause of Christ, to do the will of the Father. To see the miraculous show up to do what they did in Acts chapter 17. They turned the world upside down. We need a church that is on fire. Amen. Go ahead and put your hands together. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to worship here a little bit. We're going to come together and great prayer partners are going to pray with you. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray as long as you want to pray. If we run into the next service, we'll run into the next service. We'll be all right. Hey, we'll figure it out. We're smart people. But I want to tell you, some of you need to be filled for the first time. But some of you just need to be refilled. You haven't sought the Lord like the Bible indicates in a long time. You haven't prayed in a prayer language. Some of you ain't prayed it in years. It's not that you're afraid of the Holy Spirit because you're here every week. But maybe you're just not allowing the Holy Spirit to be permanently present the way that the Holy Spirit desires to. So here's what I want you to do. I want to, I want to pray one prayer because those, first of all, to, to be a candidate, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you got to be saved. you got to be in right relationship. You, before the power, there has to be purity. 
So I want to pray that. So bow your heads with me. And then we're going to worship together. Father, we thank you for the atmosphere of your presence in this place. God, I thank you for everything you've done. I've done my best to preach this message. God, this is, I know this is not a topic that some people preach on all the time, but God, this is Pentecost Sunday. This is a day where we celebrate the fact that you poured out your spirit on those who were hungry for you. And God, I want to tell you, I want to be refilled today. As the pastor of this house, whew, man, I'm hungry for you, Lord. If I don't have you, I don't have anything. And I'm hungry for you, Jesus. So I declare as a leader of this house, I'm hungry for you, God. And I'm going to yield all. And I want to give those an opportunity that need to surrender and yield all to you, that they'll do that right now in this moment. You say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I need to surrender all. I need to yield all because I want the fullness of the Spirit of God active in my life. I, I'm just going to surrender all. Maybe you want to rededicate yourself today. That, that's cool. No problem with that. I, I, or maybe this is the first time of salvation in your life. But you say, I want to I wanna surrender all. I want to yield. I want to commit. If that's you, just throw your hand up. It's okay. We're going to pray a prayer of salvation, dedication. There's several hands going up. You're not the only one. Yeah, several hands in the room. Come on, pray this prayer with me. Everybody in the room. There's a bunch of hands. I've seen about four or five already go up. Pray this prayer. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. Father, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. And Jesus, you're the Savior. Jesus, you're the Savior. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to forgive me. Of all my sin. Of all my sin. I yield. I yield. I surrender. I surrender. All. All. Everything, everything, all that I am, all that I, all am, that I have, all that I have to you, to you today, today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me, for forgiving me, for saving me, for saving, for me, setting me free, for setting me free, for giving me new life, for giving me new life. And I receive you now. And I receive you now. In your name, I pray. In your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Bible says, if you prayed that prayer a minute in your mind and your heart. That's the initial step. You've confessed, but now there needs to be change. It means you can't just pray a prayer and go do the same things you were doing before you came in the building. You gotta do something different. So here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna pray. If you say, Pat, if you, they got something on the screen, text faith to this, we got prayer partners that are gonna be up here. But if you say, Pastor, I wanna receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, or, I'm not even sure what that is today, Pastor, but I just know I want the fullness of the Spirit of God. And I'm ready to go after him. I want him permanently placed in my life. If that's you today, I want you to come. I want to be refilled today. I want you to come and I want you to stand right here and we're going to pray for you this morning. Maybe one, maybe 50. Hopefully it's somebody. Because if nobody's hungry for the Lord, we all need to repent one more time. Come on. Yeah. Come on, Alex. Amen. Yeah, come on. Come on, yeah. Family online, I want you just to throw your hands up right there. Right there in the living room, right there in the bedroom. If you're driving your car, don't throw your hands up. Keep them on the wheel, but pull over. And I want you just to say, God, I want all you have for me. Everybody in the room, I just want, want you to begin to pray. God, I want all that you have for me. I'm ready to pursue you. I, I, I'm going to pursue you. I, I, I'm ready to receive all that you have for me, Jesus. I want the fullness of the Spirit of God. Just like on that day of Pentecost, I want to receive everything that is as a son or a daughter of the King that I can receive. And I want to tell you that we won't hold anything back as earthly fathers. Our heavenly father is the same way. That gift that he gave on the day of Pentecost is the same gift that you can receive today. And as you begin to worship, I want you to sing. As, as we get, begin to sing, I believe there's going to be an open heaven over this house. And I believe God's going to change your native language or native tongue to a prayer language that God is going to give you. And when you begin to speak that, don't stop. Right there, you're praying in, in, your, in your house, away in your work, wherever you are. Come on, just begin to pray. Just begin to worship. Just begin to sing and, be, and begin to believe that God. The Bible says rivers of living water, water from your belly, out of your gate. That, I'm telling you, just begin to pray. 
speak that language. It's the power of the Spirit of the Lord. And once it begins, don't stop it. Just begin to pray because there is more. There is more that the Spirit of God wants to give you. Come on, would you help me sing and let's pray together. Come on, let's worship, family. If you're not seeking yourself, would you pray for these that are here? And when you need to go, you can head out. But I'm telling you, I believe God can refill. He can fill for the first time and do whatever he wants to do in this place. Would you help me pray? Would you help me sing?